Hello and welcome. March Madness is here, and so is episode 6 of 5 of the week. We have actually outlived my current season's TPE plan, and things couldn't be going any better for the podcast. Uh, to remind our listeners, we are a weekly recap show discussing weekly topics in the NCAA on the SBA forums. And we consist of I, at Okocha Star on the forums, and I am once again joined by Danger Golding. Hello, I'm still here, and again I'm the AD for the West Virginia Mountaineers. We're going to talk about a few important things coming up. Uh, recapping some of the best players of the season and the draft prospects and the first round of the March Madness that's just happened. Yeah. Uh, Before we start with our five of the week, uh, what's actually going on in the tournament? Well, we've seen um, we've seen some pretty exciting matches in the first round. Probably the most uh, exciting one was the uh, Oregon Ducks versus Kansas Jayhawks, which initially looked like it was going to be a huge blowout by the Ducks, but Kansas fought back and brought it down to a one-point game and came so close to uh, stealing a game and knocking out one of the top seeds, but unfortunately they uh, finally fell. We saw Arizona beat beat the Spartans. We saw the highly favoured Maryland Terrapins take down the Gators. We saw Duke beating Louisville, and there wasn't any other high seed upsets apart from uh, Syracuse Orange taking down the team uh, of Gonzaga Bulldogs, who, which means that unfortunately we won't get to see any more play from Robotastic Prime until he hits the SBA next season. Right, and in the uh, Syracuse Gonzaga game, we were anticipating Robotastic maybe getting some help. <clears throat> from his teammates and help he got. Mark Tiareni Plandoli scored 49 points, if I if memory serves me right. But it in the end was not enough, and Syracuse fought their way onto the second round. Yeah, before before you get up in arms in the comments and wherever you would get up in arms, keep in mind that Stefan Williams, the Wichita State power forward, has now officially retired and there already is a positional deficiency at the power forward position in the upcoming draft class. So, kind of push the boundaries with the players' positions, but they're all players who who have listed either their primary or secondary position as the position they're rated at. So, our first of the week, obviously, it's the point guard selection of the upcoming draft class. Heading the pack in TPE earnings, we have Maryland Terrapins' Eddie Donovan with 411 TPE at the time of recording. The Terrapins had 54 wins in the regular season. Eddie was a huge part of their their growth in offensive efficiency during the year. Eddie ended up with 22 points per game, 6 rebounds, 9.1 assists per game. He was third in assists all nationwide. Eddie also had 2.2 steals per game, which had him in 4th place, and a 3-point percentage of 43.5. Eddie Donovan looks to be the number one backcourt selection in the upcoming draft, and it's there should be no question why. Uh, His closest contender is the Arizona point guard Junior Jackson. Uh, Arizona had a 5th win season, made the tournament, and... uh, Junior had 22.4 points per game, 6.6 rebounds, actually higher than Eddie's, but 7.5 assists per game, which had him at 6th, and a respectable 1.9 steals per game as well. The uh, third point guard that we haven't talked about as much as he probably deserves to be talked about is Miles Lefebvre from Duke. He's uh, not a scoring guard, as you've seen from the likes of Jackson and Donovan, with only 9.3 points a game. But he's a surprisingly good rebounder. Eight rebounds again, which is seventh in the league. He's averaged over 10 assists at 10.8, which is, and also leads the league in steals at 2.3. So he could be a pretty good pick for someone. A point guard to come in shooting and scoring a ton off the bench. But he'd definitely be a, a good pickup for anyone who needs a playmaker on their squad. 
Yeah, actually, impressive this season has been Miles' work creating for both Leonard L. Church, who is a freshman shooting guard, and uh, my character J.J. Harkerwood, who last season barely saw none of the court and especially did not score on his time on the, on the court with having the likes of Winchester and Hannah Viosi out there and uh, leading the league in assists with that kind of a supporting cast is uh, especially noteworthy in my opinion. So we'll move on to a couple of players we haven't discussed that much at all, the shooting guards of the draft class. Uh, first off, we have a 378TP shooting guard, Tyrone Kings, from the University of North Carolina Tar Heels. Kings uh, averaged 26.0 points per game, which had him in 8th, uh, 6.2 rebounds. Uh, Tyrone also had an impressive 61.0 true shooting percentage, going with his 39.5 three-point percentage. and he has been a major, major part of UNC, who finished with the best record in the nation this year. Second comes Stefan Lampe, who actually had a quick mention on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. He plays for the Oregon Ducks. Oregon had a 56-win season. He's the first of two Oregon players. 20.9 points per game for Lampe. 5.7 rebounds per game. 5.9 assists per game and a one and a half steals per game. He, Lampe had a... Last one we see at the shooting guard position is Dante Zarazel for the Arizona Wildcats. He's been a really well-rounded shooting guard. He's putting up 22.3 points per game along with a decent amount of rebounds at six and a half. Fairly well sharing the ball with four assists a game. He's been a bit, pretty good shooter from range although he could probably stand to improve his two shooting percentage a bit. He's basically a, a pretty good shooting guard. No one's going to be too disappointed with him. But kind of player that we see come out of the NCAA quite often at shooting guard. Yeah, uh, in Zarasel's case, his true shooting percentage is probably lowered a lot by his woeful work at the free throw line. Only 55% from the charity stripe this season. So... While an efficient scorer, you also have to make use of those free throws. Uh, about these shooting guards, uh, has the league been sleeping on the shooting guard class this year? Or what do you think? Uh, I think the shooting guard class has been pretty well respected. There's no one here that's especially set the world on fire, you'd say. But a lot decent amount of shooting guards have been putting up above 20 points a game, around six rebounds. So a lot of them are in. Uh, maybe Tyrone Kings is uh, probably the best of the lot. Uh, I, I see him probably slightly below the likes of uh, Robotastic Prime, Hugo Nitt, Eddie Donovan, and Junior Jackson. Also, an honorable mention in the shooting guard class goes to. The sheer amount of shooting guard players going up to the draft this year looks to be around 10, uh, 11 or 10 shooting guard players with uh, players such as Anthony Caramello, who has been discussed before, and also Finn Zenglein and uh, his partner in crime, Joey Hatfield. So, we'll move on to the small forwards of the upcoming draft class. Uh, First off, we have with 363 TP Isaiah Green from the Villanova Wildcats. Uh, Villanova had a 49 win season. They are currently still in the NCAA tournament, about to face the Syracuse Orange in the second round. Green had a top 10 scoring season with 23.8 points per game, also adding almost 7 rebounds per game and 6.7 assists which was a Isaiah also shot the basketball well from beyond the arc 40.8 3 point percentage and was a big part of their team's offense with a 28% usage percentage 
Right on Green Seals is Detroit Velvet Smooth from the Wichita State University Shockers. Uh, Mid-season there was a huge discussion if Detroit could garner some attention in the MVP race, but the Shockers' team performance as a whole kind of dragged him out of contention. So Velvet Smooth averaged 28 points per game, which had him in 7th place nationwide. 6.6 6.6 rebounds, 4 assists per game, true shooting percentage of 58.2, which is very efficient for a wing player, and a usage percentage of a sky high 31.3%. A big part of the Shockers' offense for sure. The third shooting guard on our list is Rafael Nazarians for the Cincinnati Bearcats. He's obviously one of the uh, more decorated players on the list, winning the Shoot Small Forward of the Year award last year. And he joins the uh, other three shoot, other three uh, small forwards in the top ten. He had 28, which is good for sixth. So added just about seven rebounds as well, and there was sixth in the league in steals. He had a fairly high amount of the ball on, on the Bearcats roster, uh, usage percentage of 29.7, but he's part big part of the reason why uh, Cincinnati have become a staple in March over the past couple of seasons. Definitely, the uh, late season surge after the All-Star break, uh, a lot of that lies on the shoulders of Rafael Nazarians, and going into the season, Nazarians was... Uh, bound to repeat his accolade as the small forward shooting guard either or which he was whichever he was going to be slotted as this year nomination but uh, now he faces tough contention Uh, which of these three would you consider the best draft prospect it's hard to say really that all of these players are being really really good over the year but Regards to what teams look at, I think Isaiah Green has probably the the best upside at the moment, or, or it's, will at least be coming in as the most polished prospect. Because not to not to disparage the other people, but adding 6.7 assists per game, in addition to 6.8 rebounds and his 24 points per game. That's a real recipe for success, not to mention shooting 40% from range. So he's going to be coming into an SBA team ready to go as a sixth man off the bench that can provide you with playmaking and a bit of scoring whenever needed. So I think he's probably would be the top on uh, any team's list of small forwards come draft time. Truly, yeah, I would also consider the same uh, as... His usage percentage of these three players is the lowest uh, usage percentage. And for the listeners who are not familiar, usage percentage, the percentage of possessions while the player is on the field, which leads, uh, which uh, which which results in a turnover, assist, or a field goal attempt by the player in question. So having the lowest usage percent and also having the highest assist per game number with also efficient scoring he must be the leading small forward of this class with those three wingmen in the fold we'll move on to our fourth position uh, the number four position the power forward position and this is where we kind of ran into a brick wall as there were not enough players primarily playing as power forward going to the draft obviously there has to be 24 players playing as power forward around the league but this upcoming draft class only had less than a handful of them but starting off our list we have louisville cardinals power forward ralph jones ralph averaged 19.5 points per game 8.3 rebounds which was good for sixth overall uh solid two point uh, <coughs> solid two assist per game to his name as well and he was eighth nationwide in blocks per game with one and a half blocks each 40 minutes uh, second on his trail comes 
Arthur Hugo Nitt of the Michigan State Spartans. Hugo Nitt played most, mostly as the center for the Michigan State Spartans this year, but his secondary position is listed as a power forward and endless speculation could be if it would have done them any better if they had both Hugo Nitt and Kahneman out there this year. But enough of that. The Spartans also finished with a 41-41. 500 record. Hugo Nint was second league-wide in scoring with 30.6 and uh, also a respectable ninth in rebounds with 7.8 rebounds per game. He had a bit more playmaking to do he, than uh, Jones. He averaged 2.5 assists per game and his usage rate and true shooting efficiency both were fantastic with 31.4 usage and scoring at a 61.1 efficiency. The uh, last power forward on our top three list in the positions is the Louisville Cardinals forward, Lagello Frau. He's been a, a real solid force for the Cardinals this season, and especially uh, grabbing boards. He's fifth in the league with 8.6 a game. But surprisingly, he's also averaging five assists a game, which is uh, something you don't tend to see from the forward positions. He's a very modern kind of power forward as well, shooting the shooting from deep as well. He's hitting 36.2% of his frees. So he's a very unorthodox player that you don't see too often. And that could stand him to be drafted a little bit higher than some of his comparable peers. Lagello, of course, played mostly as a small forward this year as the Cardinals had Austin Roenick in his place at number four, uh, at the four. But uh, Cardinals had a strong showing in their uh, March Madness round one game versus the Duke Blue Devils. Uh, Jones played 40 minutes, scored 32 points, but Lagello playing only 22 minutes and getting into foul trouble Scoring 17 points, 5 out of 6 from deep. Uh, Lagello actually was part of a comeback run on the heels of the Blue Devils, but it resulted into a first round exit 90 to 85. Uh, with the modified power forward listings out of the way, we'll move on to our fifth position of the week the center position. There's been a lot of intrigue surrounding one center specifically this year. Of course, the one in question is the 381 TP monster, Robotastic Prime of the Gonzaga Bulldogs. The Bulldogs had a 53 win regular season, fighting their way to a good, good seeding for March, but un, uh, unsurprisingly, maybe surprisingly, suffered an first round exit at the hands of. Syracuse Orange, as Danger alluded to earlier. Robotastic Prime, of course, was the scoring leader in the nation with a whopping 35.8 points per game and adding 8.7 rebounds per game, which had him at fourth. Uh, shout out to everyone who said a Robo won't rebound. Why not? When you're 7-2 with a wingspan of three military jets, why not? Also adding in 2.3 assists per game to his name. Of all these draftees, the highest number of, uh, well, the highest percentage of usage, 33.4. So almost a third of all team possessions ended with Robo. Uh, of course, with his high scoring average, he must have had great efficiency, and so he did. 64.6 through shooting percentage, most of his attempts coming right at and around the rim. Well, to next up on our list is uh, someone, of course, I'm very familiar with, Tomislav Ivancic, who plays for the Mountaineers. A defense is a, almost the opposite kind of center to prime in that he's a real defensive specialist, but very good post defense. His rebounding was second in the league at 8.9. So uh, he's 
he's over the last half of the season he's massively added to his offensive output though averages around 22 points per game for the last half of the season so he really put some work in to develop that i could see him going fairly highly depending on fit as there's a few teams that are going to be looking for bigs in this draft so with a I think there's quite a few teams that would use a defensive backup to come off the bench when their starters are in foul trouble. Definitely. And Ivancic, throughout the season, it's been fantastic seeing him grow more to a two-way type center. Obviously, he's not an offensive superstar by any means, but starting out as a defensive stalwart and molding his game to be more all around is very encouraging to see and uh, throughout the year and if you are a listener of the podcast for many weeks you can you can see the bits where danger expects more and more scoring from Ivancic and so he has delivered throughout the year the final center and the final player of this draft preview episode is the second Oregon Ducks player Kevin Malone the center um Kevin Malone was obviously, uh, well, of course, the par- uh, Kevin Malone was of course part of the 56 win Oregon side, who were one game behind of nation leaders in record Tar Heels. The Oregon were throughout the year considered a very well-rounded defense first team, and Kevin Malone averaged 20.7 points, 7.7 rebounds, and almost two assists per game a dynamic part of their uh, run this year the uh, well Kevin Malone and the Oregon Ducks hope to make it if not the semifinals then the finals of the national tournament in regards to uh, what we might see in the in the elite eight of the NCAA tournament uh, the Ducks first Arizona Wildcats matchup is going to be really interesting. Obviously, uh, everyone expected Oregon to be really strong coming into the tournament, but they did look a bit shaky against the Jayhawks. So it's going to be a question of uh, court in in Arizona can deal with them. It's going to be a, a real match of the PGs in this matchup with uh, Eddie Donovan going against Miles Lefebvre. So I think that's going to be where the the key battle happens in this game who can get the upper hand last year obviously both Donovan and Lefebvre took part in the finals game and the league steals leader Miles Lefebvre going up against Eddie Donovan and probably the most last year's finals Eddie Donovan had quick three quick turnovers in a row and against the very high on a forced turnovers this could be a match of the for the ages and whoever comes out the winner could be considered the favorite against the ducks if down to the other side of the brackets we'll see the tar heels versus the shockers obviously the uh, big names in that matchup is going to be tyrone kings on the tar heels side and and velvet smooth on the uh, on the wichita side so that's going to be the uh, two key players, obviously, to watch out for. I think we'll probably see UNC go through here. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was a close game that went down to the wire. And then uh, Villanova versus Kuz. Obviously, after the Orange upset Gonzaga in the first round. So, this guy's the limit for the orange and they're going to be coming in with a lot of confidence after the first round so although i don't think that's going to be enough to take down this uh villanova team who've been looked really strong although they were a bit shaky to finish the season gonna have enough uh, raw talent to go through against syracuse versus xavier vernon and championship defense Villanova will have a lot of trouble scoring the ball inside, so they'll have to rely on their outside game and a and good teamwork and team ball. All right, so who's gonna win the national championship for the season 37? 
I think the all-around play of Eddie Donovan is going to lead Maryland to their title this year and make up for the close loss last year. All right. If they beat the Blue Devils, I'm all on Eddie's side. But for now, I don't think Eddie's made of anything. So, that should be all for this week's episode. <clears throat> Big thank you for Danger Golding. Always a pleasure. And uh, best of luck to those still in the national tournament and to those who are not. Make use of your Playoff Week TPE incentive. Yeah, so if you make a also uh, if you make a Playoff Week point toss this week, uh, be it draft preview, off season preview, or a mock draft type of thing, you can claim four extra TPE uncapped with your six of the media spot. Thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and we'll hope to catch you again next week with our off-season special. <laughs>